Interrompemos esse podcast para perguntar quem você quer ser? Designer. Engenheira. Pedagoga. Administrador. Quer saber? O Senac EAD é nota máxima no MEC. Tem cursos de diversas áreas, com conteúdo elaborado por especialistas do mercado e professores mestres e doutores. Ainda tem o Senac Carreiras, conectando estudantes a vagas de emprego em todo o país. Saiba mais em iad.senac.br graduação. Pausa rapidinho agora para falar de dica de ouro para os papais e mamães. Depois de experimentar a nova Hug Supreme Care Fralda Roupinha, tudo ficou ainda melhor para o meu filho. É a única com canais em X que se adaptam aos movimentos, com duas vezes proteção noturna e cintura elástica que se adapta ao corpinho do bebê, além de ser super fácil de colocar e tirar. Praticidade pura. Então guarda essa dica. Nova Hug Supreme Care Fralda Roupinha. Bebê, estamos juntos nessa, mais do que nunca. Agora curta seu podcast. Doctor, look! Stand aside, nurse. I'm Dr. Homebrew. Oh. Hey, welcome everybody. It's another episode of Dr. Homebrew. And uh, here we are, we are going to be talking homebrew, specifically competition homebrewing. And uh, I know this is sort of like upper echelon stuff, and we don't really talk too much about it, uh, because we don't know much about it other than like the judging side of things. But we're actually going to be talking to a couple of people who know a little bit about the competition side, and then we're going to get some tips and tricks and uh, just kind of a general knowledge about what to do to enter a competition, how to elevate your competition brewing, and all that kind of fun stuff. But before we get into that... I want to thank our sponsor, Five Star Chemicals. You can go to fivestarchemicals.com right now and learn the two possibly greatest ways to elevate your home brewing, which is to clean and then sanitize. That's what you got to do. In that order, fivestarchemicals.com, it'll help you out. It'll distill all that information down for you and explain the whys also. And then, of course, all of the products that they have to help facilitate cleanliness and sanitization. All yeah, right. You won't get you far without do. that. No, <laughs> in the competitive homebrewing world, you're definitely not. Absolutely not. It's uh, it's detrimental to you to not do one or the other or both. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that I've had beers um, that have lacked both of those and have brewed beers. I know for a fact that have lacked both of those, and they did and not so win. Funny story about anything. that. Okay, um, Andy, hmm. what's going on? <laughs> my my former co brewer and I um, entered a competition a couple of years ago and had a, a bottling station set up and we had our sanitizer in one keg to flush the line, make sure everything was good to go. Then you switch over and you bottle off your fresh keg and everything's great. So we're going through and we're getting our last entries in there, fill up the uh, Saison, I think it was, that was, yeah. we we're really proud of it. Uh, came mm -hmm. out really nice, scored highly in a couple other competitions. We got the score sheets back and they gave us a zero. Ooh. I was like, wait, hold on. I thought there's a gentleman's 13 or something that oh. we had to get for this. <laughs> right. Um, we sent them three bottles of Star Sand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So, lesson learned. Wow. Don't drink while you're bottling. I'm surprised they even gave you a score. I'm surprised they didn't just say, like, you know, not this eligible. Not I, yes. I thought you got a one for clarity. <laughs> You're right. You're right. We did get a one. Uh, for, and uh, yeah, well, that's like, just, well, it was filled correctly. That's just some yeah, sauciness right. right there. That's yeah. going to be prickly mouthfeel right there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's oh, man, weird, man. everybody has had a problem with sanitizer at some point where they've they've dumped it into their beer or something. I've never that's that's a new one on me. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty I've good. Had, I've had the suck back thing happen before. Or you're, sure. You're blow off and it's like, oops, there goes some into my fermenter. <laughs> If I were judging that beer, I'd say this beer is very clean. It's very oh, clean. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. What a, uh, they, high they foam. Be able to tell this just by the smell of it. Oh, that's that's star sand. I mean, oh, I'm sure they didn't <laughs> drink it. I mean, you know, it's like a, a opaque liquid. No, I'm sure no one drank it. I'm sure they're, you know, whatever. But uh, anyway, uh, the voice you just heard is Andy and uh, the other one is Matthew. And they're from a Facebook group called Competitive Home Brewing. Welcome to the show, boys. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. So tell me a little bit about the Facebook group, Competitive Homebrewing. How long has it been around? When, did you guys start the group? Those are two questions I have for you, Go. Yeah, I think we started about, what, 2018, 2019, somewhere around there. Okay, recent. Um, just trying to look to build a community for competitive brewers to get together and discuss, you know, tactics and competitions and uh, that sort of thing. And it took off pretty slowly. Mm -hmm. um, sure. But really has hit some momentum recently um, with a lot of... Uh, 
a lot of people finding it and sharing it with their friends, sharing it with their, you know, other competitors. And I think we just hit, how many did we hit today, Andy? We hit, we had two extra members join today that put us over 700. Nice. Well, wow. yeah. that's pretty good, right man. Congratulations. And I mean, if I'm honest, we kind of started this thing because Matt and I are, are crazy people, right? So we have a random idea about something and we get super obsessed about it, which I mean, most brewers can say that. Yeah. Um, but we're really, really hyper competitive. And I was like, man, I don't want to bog down our, our homebrew club with all these conversations about competitions and just all they ever see on there. There's got to be more people out there that want to talk about competitions. And frankly, I want to find more to join. Uh, I like mm. competitions that have really cool awards. Uh, I love going to ceremonies and being able to share with the people locally. So we started it and we're like, let's just see what happens. It's probably going to end up just the local uh, Lone Star Circuit here in Texas kind of people. And man, it was, it was crazy. I don't, I don't know what really sparked it, but we started getting people from all over the country and now it seems like every day there's three or four brand new competitions that uh, we've never heard of that are getting posted out there and a ton of traction. Um, like we were talking about that, you know, people sh sharing tips, sharing competitions that they're entering, um, getting feedback on things, getting advice on where and how to enter things. It's a, it's a fun forum to have uh, and a, a unique one out in the homebrewing community, in my opinion. Yeah. Is it a private group or is it public? Can anybody just go in and join or do you need to like fill out a questionnaire and send in a bottle of beer to, to get the, the approval. Mm. It's, it's uh, private. Um, okay. We've learned through our club's Facebook page that it's a lot better to keep it private. Um, I had some interesting characters <laughs> try to join <laughs> our, <laughs> our Facebook page. So, like, so we have some questions on there, but it's an automatic, uh, you know, if you, if you answer them, uh, it automatically accepts you. Okay. What are people doing? Like uh, when it was public, were they just uh, making, like making fun or um, a lot of spam, a lot of like, Single women in your area need conversations yes. now. Yes. Discreet. Lots, lots of that. Okay. Tons of that. All right. So, yeah. We yeah. went through a, an audit of it a few years ago because um, Facebook has this thing where if you're over 500 members, you can't automatically invite everybody in your group. So when our hmm. club grew over 500, I was like, all right, I'll go and I'll clean up people that haven't been active in call it three or four years. And man, there were a lot of uh, single people from other countries that were for some reason in our home uh, club. And I'm like, I'm pretty <laughs> sure they're not brewers. I am Tatiana and I am from <laughs> Moscow and I homebrew very much. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, exactly. whatever you, you are. my brochure about politics. <laughs> <laughs> much beer. Good. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Facebook's beer. weird like that. I mean, I, I'm not surprised it took, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of gained traction slowly. It's probably just because people are sharing it. And finally that algorithm picked up and decided to like send it to more people, but also, during the pandemic, especially, um, you know, which we're still in now, by the way, I just want to make that clear, um, <laughs> that people have taken up homebrewing. I think it's it's gotten more people into into the uh, the art and the science and the hobby of homebrewing. So you're probably getting a ton of people going, well, now I have all this beer. And, and they don't know about all these cool <laughs> competitions that there out were in the past. <laughs> yeah, I think you're I think you're exactly right. Yeah. You know, people people needed to spend their time doing stuff. I started a YouTube video series called Mean Brews during the pandemic. Nice. Uh, but now now they have this beer and they want to do something with it. And this is another avenue for them to enjoy the hobby, you know, get out there and compete and see how their stuff really is. Yeah. yeah. How long a lot of people that are like, I didn't even know that competing in beer was a thing. And they start getting really excited and start realizing there's this whole other angle, this whole other avenue uh, to pursue within the hobby. So it's yeah, you cool. too can get mad at someone, uh, at a judge 50 <laughs> miles away for filling out a form incorrectly. <laughs> you know I, mean? I, I may or may not have several beers named after judges that i was upset about oh no, absolutely mm -hmm. hopefully one was named brian cooper yeah i'm hoping <laughs> well, one should be at least named people. brian yeah uh, <laughs> um another thing i see a lot you know posts of in there too are uh pictures of the actual medals that people have taken home and and some serious ribbons and like as a you know, as a occasional competition organizer, it makes me like, damn, I need to step up my game. <laughs> we, we totally wanted that. We wanted, you know, competitions to covet us bringing our stellar entries into the competition and upping their game with with better prizes and awards. And that was definitely a goal of ours with with creating that. And it's working. You know, we're seeing mm -hmm. that we're seeing people advertising. Hey, look what you, you can get if you enter this. So, uh, you know, that, that brings my attention when I see something cool on there yeah. and I want it, I'm going to go enter it. So you're, yeah. so you're having competition organizers posting in the group, Hey, these are the prizes for our competition in, you know, 
fucking Idaho Minnesota. or whatever. There's, yeah, there's one, there's one yeah. in Tennessee that's offering a five hundred dollars for first place, but you have to you have to bring ten gallons of beer there and serve it. Jesus, mm. dude. Yeah. I mean, yeah, why not? There have yeah, been some, some competitions over the years offering like huge prizes like that. Just and then, like there was some random fair in our area. Do you remember that one, Brian? One of the one of the fairs. They go San Mateo. Yeah, you know. Now that you mentioned that, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was San Mateo when I used yeah, to live in my, San Mateo County. But that was a long time ago. Yeah, he got like two first places and a you know something runner up as a show or something, and just got like seven hundred bucks out of it or something crazy. God. Like, dude, I wonder what the, what the shelf life of competitions like that are because that's not really sustainable. I mean, you have to, you know. Eh. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't Who know where, where that money was coming from, but yeah, yeah. Know, it right? seemed like a fluke, like just a, a typo. Somebody added an extra zero, and yeah, just or, or maybe out. or maybe it's like the barbecue circuit. You know, that started out very amateur, and now you can mm-hmm. win super prizes there. You know, I, I liken what we do very similar to that. Just hasn't taken mm-hmm. off like like the barbecue has. You know, yeah, that makes that makes some sense. But it was kind of interesting to me mm-hmm. hearing some of these things is kind of how in some respects home brewing may have kind of gone full circle where this stuff where people are brewing on their own and they don't know clubs. What are those competitions? I, I don't know about that. Uh, and they just wanted, they, they saw uh, something in the newspaper. Uh, that's how old I am. They saw, uh, drove by a homebrew store. So, you know, maybe I'll try to make beer. And then you ended up with, you know, people starting to enter competitions who had no idea what a competition is and competitions trying to attract people by having, you know, good prizes and things. And yeah. then that's that wheel kind of turned and people were more concerned about, well, can I can I do well at a big comp? And I don't really care about the prizes that much. I just want to I want to get that 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 medal, no matter how, how it looks. Uh, and I don't know, in, in a way, it's kind of like there's a maybe a whole slug of people from covid who kind of came to home brewing through non-traditional ways that we we can't reach them in the AHA or Brewing Network or whatever, but maybe they're on Facebook and they're, those people are coming into the hobby in the same way that maybe some of us did in the 90s. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm personally, I think homebrewing ap- appeals to different people for different reasons, which is what makes the club scene so much fun, right? You'll get, yeah. like, Matt's an engineer by trade, so he automatically starts to geek out, uh, like, hyper-technical on the process of, of making beer and refining every detail about it and optimizing every single piece of it. You get other people that are... Um, they're expats, right? So they're, they're here and they can't get the beer that they've always had back home. So they start mm. to make that beer as part of a memory or to keep that, that thing alive in their mind. And then you'll get somebody who's just super artistic and wants to express it that way. Um, it, it's really interesting to get those people in the same room and talking about beer and sharing their stuff because like, no one doesn't have a story when they pour a beer for you. So being able to share that with them is, is really, really awesome. Uh, and for me, I started out just like with a friend uh, learning about it because I was making wine at the time. And he had like the easiest sales pitch. He was like, so how long does it take for wine to be drinkable? Mm, yep. I don't know, six months or a year? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. He's like, dude, from brew day to the day it's in your glass, we're talking like 10 days. And I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, I need, I need to be doing that. Yeah. And mm. uh, we walked into a competition one day, and it was the Blue Bonnet Brew Off in, in Dallas. Yeah, it's a it's, big one. Yeah, it's massive, right? And yeah. It was my first competition that I ever walked into. And you know, hundreds of people there, uh, 1,500 entries, I think, that year. And I was like, okay, hold on. You can compete in, in making beer. This is nuts. Uh, and growing up hyper competitive and everything that I did, I, I missed that. I missed that element in my life of being able to like go toe to toe with somebody and the playful banter back and forth of, if I can be better than you at this, I can prove it. And, and the competitive side of it was just really rewarding. And then the competition also serves the, the goal and the function of, of helping develop better brewers from uh, from all the good feedback that they should be getting from those competitions. So mm-hmm. it's multifaceted in why people join the hobby. It's multifaceted in why they enter competitions. Uh, and we start to see, you know, those things start to feed on each other uh, where people are starting to make the beer, they enter competitions and their quality continually grow, goes up and grows. Yeah. I, just observationally, the quality of homebrew competition entries has greatly improved over the last, during the mm-hmm. 14 years that I've been judging, you know, it's just, uh, it's gone mm. really up. <laughs> and so you can really tell, like there's very few of the, of the just super, super clueless. Like I just entered this beer to see what's wrong with it. Kind of people, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, paying the 14 bucks or whatever. 
<laughs> some of the competitions yeah. cost. And, people sitting in you know, star sand and shit like that. People are putting their best foot forward and really playing, you know, the A game and, and uh, you know, going for those medals and stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it's as a judge, it's it's uh, a pleasure to brew it. Although on the show, we also love talking to people who really are having struggles and learning how to do things. And we take a lot of that. Those are the, yeah. maybe some of the more fun ones for us to talk about, but we would really enjoy also tasting some of your beers just because they're probably pretty damn good. <laughs> well, speaking of, speaking of the competition getting more and more difficult. Yeah. Andy, Andy talked about me being a statistical nerd. So I took all of our clubs meddling scores Uh-oh. for, for years progressively and watched that S curve, how the higher the score, the more likely to medal. Mm. And that curve shifted two points in one year after we really started getting seriously com- competing. Wow. And then the next wow. year, another point. So what does that you know, mean? Something that would medal a 38 at 50% chance, it would take a 41. Oh, you know, the, okay. The, the next year. Because is that so, just the quality of the beers have gotten that much the, better? The competition. And, you know, we're trying to figure out why. Yeah. And, and I think people are getting more educated because of shows like this, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Or these systems, these automated systems take out, you know, the, the variables that you can go wrong, mm-hmm. become less as you brew. But definitely, uh, the first, first Blue Bonnet Stein I won was in 2008. And, you know, I, went to, I moved to Europe for five years, came back and started brewing again. I brewed that beer about 10 times since then. I can't score over 33 with it. Exact same recipe, exact same process. What is it? What style it's, is it? It's uh, Cali Common. Okay. Cali it's, Common. It's a hard a one. decocted Cali Common, though. It was like a decocted. I can't <laughs> believe you remember that. <laughs> Jeez, wow. Dude. So it was my first Mean Brews beer I ever brewed, and I, I won a Blue Bonnet Stein with it. First competition, I entered one entry into the biggest comp, single site comp in the, in the country, mm-hmm. and I won a Stein with it. So, Well, congratulations. So what is that, uh, Fluke? Uh, was it just that good? Was it a little bit of both? And why, why do you think you can't hit that mark again, or at least even close to it? Um, I'm, I'm brewing on a different system now. Okay. So that's one variable. I'm, I'm all about variables, right? Control yeah. variables. Right. Um, I think the competition's better. I think, mm. you know, putting that beer against others that are more refined and, and have more evolved, um, to recent tastes because tastes have evolved. If you watch my YouTube channel, you'll see everything is evolving with beer and, you know, the, the Lupulin shift is real and, uh, people's perception of hops is is much less sensitive so you're competing against a, a different beer than i brewed 10 years ago mm-hmm. it's in a different set of standards um regardless of what the bjcp is right yeah i think the style yeah. itself hasn't descriptively changed that much you know at a, over the years oh, defi- so definitely it's, not but it's the very, perception of what is good in that style yeah. has very t- and, tightly around one beer <laughs> yeah well and i right. think that's the hard part when you enter judge it when you enter enter beers and then also as as part of a judge it's you, i think it's really hard to not allow at least some of what you enjoy leak through to the actual judging it has to still mm. you have to still like it i mean it can be to style it still has to be good on some well, level well, you guys are master judges right the, the overall impression is supposed to be they how are. you liked it right Correct. they yeah. are the brian's are i'm a dipshit so <laughs> I'm, I'm just, just, uh, yeah, I'm just so yourself short jp you're yeah, a master dipshit i'm a uh, recognized <laughs> yes i'm a master dipshit but i'm i'm recognized and i judged two competitions and said this is too much work for my ass dude i don't want to do it <laughs> so you're and honestly that that's a really good point in my opinion um when we started really growing in our club like five years ago our club competition only ran like 35 entries and this mm. year we filled up a 600 entry competition in two hours wow. so like the growth has been radical so we have the the struggle of like how do we get more judges how do we fill seats how do we get these entries quality judge uh quality judge these entries and get people you know to continue coming back to it and one of the things that we kept finding was that that bottleneck of man it takes me 10 15 minutes to get through a score sheet and then you get you know a flight of seven eight beers and that's a, a big time commitment yeah uh, so we did a lot of work to build our own digital score sheet um, during COVID so that we could actually tell people you can judge from home with a remote judging partner. Hmm. Uh, everything is typed so you can actually read it and it's not just scribble on a piece of paper and you're like, I have no idea what that says. It's a Brian Cooper from my yeah. doctor, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my <laughs> score sheet. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I, I wasn't pointing fingers, but uh, I, it really helped our judges to be more, um, more willing to take on more flights. Um, this year was an mm-hmm. interesting one for us. We had our, our judges fill out a form first and like, Hey, I'm willing to judge. X number of flights of beers. And we actually had to um, 
turn a couple judges away because we didn't have enough flights to give everybody. We had so many judges and they were all like, yeah, I'm willing to judge seven flights. Hmm. And the cool thing about the model of doing it all remote in the first round was like Matt and I can judge one flight tonight. Uh, me and Jason can judge one flight tomorrow and yeah. I don't have to leave my house. Uh, you know, I can go tuck the kid in and then I can come back and judge a flight of beer over zoom, turn in my score sheets and I'm done for the night. So the, yeah. uh, the average person signed up for seven flights and we only had enough to give them three. So yeah. the judging has not been the problem for us anymore, which is, which is awesome. What's your club? Good, uh, what's your club? You keep refer- referencing your club, but uh, uh, the King Island Aylers. King Island Aylers. 2017 Gambrinus Award winners. Uh, cool. <laughs> and where, where are you guys? Where are you guys based at? Uh, Katy, Texas. Okay, which is uh, just west of Houston. Near Houston. I, yeah. I used to live down by Johnson Space Center for a year, like in the early 90s. Yeah, they, okay. were gonna, they were going to send him to orbit, but uh, he was too tall. Uh, <laughs> I, I they was. Were gonna, they were going to send him didn't home. Want me. Yeah. <laughs> they were going to send him back home, but you know, didn't want a him. monkey won that competition. <laughs> yeah. uh, I sent the monkey. <laughs> so when when you when you're on the when when you're in the group and you know people are talking, what are some of the things that the folks are sort of trading information, uh, you know, back and forth? I, and I know that's people have obviously written books and done you know whole podcast networks about this sort of thing. But like, what are the what are the common uh, the common problems people are discussing on in your group. and actual useful stuff you've gotten yeah. out of it, you know, from people randomly coming in. Yeah. So we, and I, I'll go first and Matt can think of something much better than mine. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there is some process stuff, but I think in a competitive landscape, like what that group really is, it's not a lot of beginner conversations that you're seeing. It's, mm-hmm. it's people that are established in, in what they do. They have their process down and they're looking to either refine stuff, find other competitions to enter. Or one of my favorite threads that was out there for a while was um, what categories can I cross enter to maximize the number of beers that I can get in? and have a chance at meddling. So okay. the conversation was going around like, do you, do, can anybody actually tell the difference between a Scottish export and a Scottish heavy? And the whole group was like, nah, not really. <laughs> so you can cross those. Yeah. Yeah. And like I ran an experiment this year based on some of the feedback I saw where like I brewed um, my alt beer and my alt beer has always been very successful for me. Uh, low to mid forties in score metals more often than it doesn't. Mm-hmm. I've been entering it as a, uh, a British bitter in all three subcategories. And in the first competition of the year that I entered, it went first, second, and third and scored 44, 42, 40 as a British bitter. And I was like, well, I never saw that coming. Your wow. alt but it was, beer it was just, a British bitter. Wow. Okay. Just how you perceive the style based on the guidelines, they're remarkably similar. Uh, but the German side of me was like, this does not make any sense. There's, there's no way that this should work the way it is. Uh, so it's, it's the creative ways that people are looking at how to enter competitions um, my my big one when I first started competing was there were a lot of competitions that had to consolidate and and shrink the number of categories because there weren't enough entries really to let the category stand on its own. And I always go to category 12, uh, Pale Commonwealth as my my example, but you'd get like two or three entries there, which means it would then get consolidated with like the British bitter category or some other thing. And I was like, no, screw that. I'm going to brew all three subcats. And now it has enough entries where they have to judge it on its own. And now there's more points and more medals being awarded at this competition. And especially ah. when you think about like a circuit where every point matters for the end of the year total, things like that really start to add up. So the, the creativity in, in some of those conversations was a lot of fun um, for me to be a part of. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, for, for me, yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, <laughs> getting people's feedback on something you want to try, like cross-centering. You know, have you ever cross-centered a German Pilsner into a Czech Bills, you know, had been been successful, you know, and that type of stuff. Also, personally, there's some market intelligence type stuff too. You know, for example, you know, just found out Annie Johnson's going to enter her Czech Pills in NHC. And I'm like, I'm not going to enter mine now. (laughs) There's no way I'm going to win, you know? God, this is like, uh, this is like uh, spring training shit where it's like, well, there's a rumor it's like yeah. Moneyball. There's a rumor that this guy's going to enter it. I'm like, whoa! Mm-hmm. I was going to put mine in, but let me find another beer. Here. Damn, she's just right. clearing. And, and he's kind of like out. Jamil used to be in that that sense, right? Like, oh, I'm not going to enter this. Jamil's going to win this category. And I was like, oh, Annie's going to win this. I'm not, I'm not going to enter there. No, yeah. but there is that. And so, you know, to be honest, I I like competing. You know, so I'm going to put my check pills in there because I want to beat her. Hell yeah! You know, you definitely so, should. You know, but that's that's a cool part of it. And watching, you know, seeing these guys in the cl- in that uh, group that are, you know, they're superstar brewers. You see what they win, and you see that you're going to go up against them in a competition. That just feeds me. You know, I'm a competitive mm. guy. I want to win. I want to show 
it just bugs me when I don't win, you know? So <laughs> yeah, that's, well. that's a cool part of it is that you get to compete against the best and we now yeah. plan, you know, through this to compete against each other uh, across the U S hmm. so well, and, and when you're probably spending a thousand dollars or more on just <laughs> homebrew, you know, entries every year, you got to maximize what you're what you're using, what you're getting in to, you know, the the bang for buck approach there too, probably. All right, note to self: make sure my wife doesn't listen to this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, pesos, right? other people do this, Andy. <laughs> exactly. Not not, not you. me. Not me. No, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. responsible. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's <laughs> it's funny you talk about cross entering because Jamil would always say uh, when when this topic would come up either you know on the session or his shows or whatever um you know should you cross enter and he would always if i remember correctly and if if uh if i'm not then he didn't say it but if i am then he did say mm. it, um to never do that if you want to get good at brewing a style brew that style don't pretend it's another style because judges will be able to tell i've and, seen and i've I, seen t- two brewers take a a uh, english bitter and put it in alt beer and get gold medals with it see and and this is i think that evolution of beer where back in like the late 90s, maybe early 2000s, that, that was more of a thing where you didn't have so many uh, entries in a competition like that. Maybe you had like one or two alt beers. You know what I mean? And so you can kind of like tell the difference, maybe. Um, but even at GBF level, you see this kind of thing happening all the time. You know, people win uh, IPA in for pale ale or vice versa or whatever. Um, where yeah, like the Corona used to cross center. Uh, an IPA into pale ale and double IPA. It was one of those that kind of met right in the middle. Yeah. And he would meddle in all of them. It sounds like a beer yeah. I would hate. Absolutely. Well, and, <laughs> you know, and I think it was even a couple of GBFs ago where someone would like, they won for IPA and like the, the name clearly it was like blah, 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 pale ale. It was in the name. It was in the name <laughs> of the fucking beer. That's that awesome. Yeah. And it's like, this is, we're sort of this nebulous sort of collection of styles that, the the guidelines i don't know if they mean less now or there's so many styles that they just sort of it's like a almost a venn diagram of a, a, a lot of these i think things. i think it goes back to if you know in that example i gave with a bitter and an alt it was yeah. probably an awesome beer right sure yeah and if and you get swayed by that as a judge i'm a judge right if i've got an awesome beer at the table i'm going to give it more points even if it's not 100% style just because of how well it was crafted and how great of a beer it is you know, I stay within the guidelines, but yeah. it's hard to ignore great beer. That, it, yeah. That's what I, that's what I'm saying, and and I think like you wouldn't be able to cross enter a mediocre alt beer if it was yeah, sort right. of an alt beer, but not. Is this maybe a brown? Ale? I don't know. Maybe it's a thing, and I think that's the difference, and I think that's the point that you guys are making in in, in the group. It sounds like, and then what we want to obviously hit too that you, you know it it needs to be the style. It can't be maybe the style. Because you can't they make excellent beer. I mean, but they make just, excellent beer. So, like, can you, know. you like? I yeah, you can't cross enter a mediocre beer. If if you know, if you go, oh, I don't even know if this is an alt beer, then you're not going to enter it. In any, it's not going to do anything. Right. I mean, and back and in the I day, think, you know, people would say like, "Oh, I made this this you know pale yes. ale, but it tastes kind of it's not hoppy enough, and it's a little too dark." And I was like, "Well, enter it as an amber ale, but it's not a great amber mm-hmm. ale either. So why would they even do that? You know?" Yeah, <laughs> and I think in an ideal world, Jamil's right. Like if you should enter the right beer in the right style and it should be judged that way. But unfortunately mm-hmm. the, the data doesn't show that that's hundred percent accurate. Like yeah. You can consistently see that. Um, and I, I lean back on, on the Scottish beers, the, uh, the bitters, um, dark, mild and, and British Brown. I, I, ha- I can show you years of score sheets from multiple cities and multiple States where those beers score right in line with each other in both subcategories very, very, very consistently. And they're good or great in both of those. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it's 2017 or 2018, in our competition, I scored a 49 and a 47 with the same beer in two different subcategories. Oh, it's like you, wow, dude. You, you can't tell me that the beer wasn't good or perceived. It was Is judged that, by that a English brown? Judge. Yeah. English brown? That's, oh, that's, brown. that's pretty amazing, Damn, dude. So you so that's, you track yeah. your all your score sheets. You have a, a spreadsheet, I guess, or how do you how do you keep track of your information? Maybe so, maybe there's insane the people out there that want to do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> so we started a you know when I when I started looking at circuits and investigating competitive brewing, I looked back like ten years of people in the circuit. I'm like, who are these people? Mm-hmm. What happened to them? Why did they stop competing? And so I set up this program called Master Homebrew Program where you can you can earn these badges. It's a ranking system based upon how you've scored on multiple subcategories of beer. Hmm. And for example, I'm Grandmaster 4. That means what, 20? I have 20 different 
subcategories of beer with score sheets over 43. Um, wow. So, you know, it, 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 and this, this is how we track. We've gotten, we now have 108 members in the program and you can find it on Facebook too, master homebrew program. Right. Um, Check and, it out. and there's a whole bunch of criteria there, but that's how we kind of track as a group, a, a really a subset of the competitive brewing group is this master homebrew program. Uh, it's free to join. Uh, if you want the badges, it's twenty dollars a year. Uh, but but this is this is how we're really tracking, and this is how we know who the really good brewers are uh, out there that are competitive. Yeah, it's but I mean, to, with the, go ahead. To Amy. also directly answer, yeah, I I kept every score sheet uh, with the ex- exception of one competition, which drives <laughs> me nuts because I think it's the one that would actually cost me ranking up um, to the next level. But I had every score sheet from the time that I started. And when I submitted them all, Matt was like, good Lord, dude, but you, we <laughs> track it. I have multiple spreadsheets from every year and it's, this competition had X number of entries. The category that it was entered in had this number in it. And I entered my beer that scored this way. So I can track geographically. Hey, for some reason in Dallas, this beer scores better than it does in Houston. So watch that, be aware of it. If I'm having to narrow down what I can enter in one competition, what I can't, I'll factor there, in things like that. There, there's a competitor in Houston, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to name his name, but he's well known. He's probably the one of the greatest homebrewers in Texas ever, and he tracks judges, and he knows judges geographically and what their preferences are. That sounds like, that's will, a little scary. Yeah, it sounds like a will, threat, dude. He wow. brew, <laughs> you know I mean? It's extremely successful, and he will brew to the judges' palate. I'll brew a bar, beer that Brian Shar likes. Yeah, that's <laughs> nice. I'm the best to show here. If you if you yeah. look up Lone Star Circuit and look at who's won it the most, you'll see. You'll, wow. you'll know I mean, who that person is. I mean, mm. the only way you can get, I would imagine, like really accurate data. I mean, I wonder if God, I wonder if there's homebrewers out there sharing information on particular judges. <laughs> you know, Matt, what does my okay? rap sheet look like? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I, I personally I haven't, haven't gotten it. to that level yet because yeah. it's too random. Who you're going to get? Yeah. You know? I mean, it's just uh, after the any, fact. Any like, competitor also understands that it's a double-edged sword. Like, we participate in judging as well, and we understand the variable and the variance of um, of judging in a competition. So, the last thing you want to do is put a judge on blast because you're just putting a target on yourself too. And right. Maybe somebody just had a bunk yeah. bottle. Maybe their palate was a little bit shot from being later on in a flight. There's so many different things that can happen where your beer just scores worse in this one competition, or it's not perceived the same way. Uh, I'll um, also. I'll also say, you know, I track numbers. Um, you're more likely to medal with a high 30 score than you are with a low 40 score. You've, if you're in the low 40s, you've hit somebody's, I really like this beer, but you haven't hit the general population. So if you look at that curve, it kind of, it has a peak at about 38. Mm-hmm. So if you've got a 38 beer in one competition, you keep entering that because you're right in the mid range of what people's palates really enjoy. Yeah. It's, it's that's wild. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess it makes sense. Like I've, you know, I've entered this oatmeal stout. I've been farting around with for years and it gets like 42 is the top, like 35 to 42 maybe. And it's just never done anything ever in mm-hmm. the second round of nationals. Just never. And I'm like, well, I sort of gave up. Well, nationals is a crap shoot anyways. Well, yeah. But, and I, I guess like that's the only thing I thought about because to, to be completely honest, I don't, I don't know about, competitions going on i don't know i don't wouldn't know about a competition in tennessee or maine or whatever there's because a facebook page for that there's know. a facebook page for that now yeah i know but like you know when i was really doing it i'm like i don't i just don't i don't know and you know there's like bulletin boards i guess i'm old enough to remember bulletin boards mm-hmm. like forum posts you could i don't know but now it's like i just i didn't but now it's easy yeah. if it's all in one place for me a competitive mm-hmm. homebrewing facebook page yeah. Um, that sounds cool. Yeah. I mean, it's judge, been super yeah. interesting because you get we get all these people that are all over the place, and you know, if you're a competition coordinator and organizing it or running a club, uh, I'm specifically from one, a person running a club, right? The a competition can be your entire budget for the year, like that will fund everything else that your club does for the mm. rest of the year. So it needs to be successful uh, in order to let your club do a lot of the other social things that they want to do or educational programs that you guys want to run. So them growing their competition gives them the ability to go and try and get new brewers. It gives them the ability to advertise. It gives them, you know, fun stuff that they can do that they wouldn't have been able to do without a competition. So they get on our page and like, Hey man, look at these cool medals that we got. Look at these cool trophies that we're doing for best of show. And I mean, they need to be careful what they wish for because those competitors see it and they just bombard it. And we've had, we've had a couple of clubs reach out and they're like, Hey, we went from 80% of our, um, and my numbers are not, 
completely accurate here, but you know, 75% or 80% of our medals were given out to local people in years past. And the second that it got posted on y'all's page, only 30% are going to people within the city. Wow. I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, it, that's a risk that you run. Yeah. Yeah. I but guess you filled up your competition. You filled up your competition. I, I guess at that point you have to decide what you care about the most. Local yeah. people or, or get you're in trying to figure out how to scale. Yeah. Yeah. It, you could do that too. Yeah. Or maybe you have like a different award. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, well, but I yeah. Mean, to me, I, I think it was a big concern that people are starting to look at, you know, the last several years competitions as a whole, at least in Texas, were really starting to suffer and they were struggling to even maintain the numbers that they were historically. You'd see, mm. you know, competitions that were always 600, 800, 900 entries that now were like begging people to enter to get to 400 and 500. And even then the judging was, was hard to get there. Um, yeah, it was and, hard. It's been hard to get judges and there were a judges. lot more novice judges coming in for some, you know, I don't know why, but it just, there were so, so many competitions that, you know, exploded over the time. That, and then that, yeah, I think homebrewing maybe declined a little bit in popularity the few years before the pandemic. Um, it's since come up, and who knows what it's going to do next. But yeah, the the judges were hard to get, and I've heard stories are all around from organizers like that had to had to enlist a little bit, you know, lower quality judges. And the entr- entrants aren't happy, and and, oh. and the scoring isn't right. And I'm offended know, just, by that. It's terrible. There, yeah. There's <laughs> a, a recent competition in Georgia where they weren't expect, expecting the influx of meads and ciders that our group brought to that uh, competition <laughs> okay and they've been struggling to judge the numbers and you know when you look at the winners and that they've already done the beers and they've announced the beers it's people in our group you know it's like 90 mm. percent of it's in our group and that's kind of what andy's alluding to and i was talking with another uh, guy that's in our group and i'm like well there's two ways they can take it they can they can make it local or they can get better you know and and if this drives someone to get better if there's people out there like us that are pissed because they didn't want a medal in their local competition, they're going to get better. And that, to me, that's great. If you yeah. become a better brewer because of it, that's, that's what our goal is really. Yeah. I mean, it is sort of like maybe sometimes depending on the competition, it's like the major league team coming down to the minors for a second. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I could see why people would be a little pissed, but at the same time, through no fault of anybody's, that's just the way it is. You know, I, I know that uh, some regional competitions, people, the brewers there want to stay regional so they can win medals because they're the best brewer in the region or whatever. Oh, but yeah, if you I mean, open it up nationally, with, with the- then people are, then, then they're going to be up against better brewers. And you're right. They should take that into account and go, oh, okay, I do need to get better. I'm not, you know, hot shit. Um, you know, it's like the Harlem Globetrotters play the Washington Generals or whatever the fuck. It is. It's yeah, like, okay. but, but traditionally, they've opened up to you know national entries just to get the counts that they need to fund right. their club. And like you guys um, are saying, you're going to get that level once you open it up. You hit yeah. your numbers, but you're going to get people who are better brewers than you regionally. And and I think nine times out of ten, most home brewers are going to be like, oh, okay, I just got washed out. That's fine because I just need to get better, and that's great. So you guys basically brought the barrel and the, everyone else is supplying the fish for you guys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it. You're just looking for, for comps. I've, I'm, I'm teasing for the most well, it's, part. It's just a different kind of group. Like, like the brewing network yeah. is a different kind of group. And they came in, they, you share a lot of knowledge on our, on your show. So the people who listen to it, were learning and learning how to brew better beer. And then they came in and started winning medals at NHC and everybody got pissed off, but you know, it's just, <laughs> I'll say this. Yeah, I mean, well. if you, if, if there are people out there that, you know, have, are not winning these and want to get better, join this group because I'm an open book. I have a, you know, I, I share every detail about every recipe that I have. And, you know, I will, I will give you whatever you need to make you successful. So, you know, this, this is not a a secretive homebrewing group um, of, of competitors. We, we want to make each other better. So there's, there's no, there's no real secrets here um, between any of us. That's what I like about yeah, the hobby in general, and exactly. you know, doing this show for people, you know, same thing, kind of. I mean, we love to win, but we don't want to screw the little guy. You know, we want you to come up with us. You know, for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's the way it should be. Well, Andy and Matt, thanks a lot for uh, for joining us. You guys can join the Facebook group. It's called the Competitive Home Brewing. It's uh, obviously on Facebook, and uh, it sounds like you have to answer one or two questions or whatever, and you'll get you'll get jumped right in, as they say, as the kids say these days. Get them up to a thousand here in another month. Or so. Is yeah, that what the cool. kids say, JP? That's what the kids say. You get jumped into the Facebook group, yeah. <laughs> and that's who knows. Maybe you'll meet your next uh, significant other in the spam. You know, you don't know. 
<laughs> way Facebook works. Uh, no, but anyway, check it out if you if you guys are, are even slightly interested in in entering competitions. It sounds like a really great group of people, uh, very open and sharing and wanting you to succeed. And that's really what we're trying to do here in homebrewing in general. We don't ever want anybody to uh, get shitteth upon and and keep making subpar <laughs> beer. We want everybody to be making great beer. And uh, you know, the more groups you can join to do that. Uh, you should really do it. So the Competitive Home Brewing Group uh, Facebook. Yes, Brian Cooper, go ahead, please. I know Harold was was sipping on something really nice, too, and made a little visit to a, a regional brewery out, out here. I, I just wanted to give him a chance to mention that. If you, uh, sorry, Harold, I keep seeing his name Matthew, on the screen. Matthew. Matthew, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Matthew getting, brought, gonna, something, brought uh, something tasty back talk, from California. Talking about softballs. Some, let's see, can you oh, see it? The, 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 you hold it it's blurry. It's blurry. Oh, the worry from Heretic. From Heretic. That's such a great beer. Buddy of mine, Travis Combo, is good friends with Jamil, and you know, kind of by network, I've, I've get to got to know Jamil a little bit. And we were in, on vacation in uh, that area, so I hit up the brewery, met uh, you know the crew down there. Travis told me to buy this one, and I just loved it. And we were going to talk about, um, I don't know if you want me to talk about where I would enter it. Sure. And, yeah. So this is a a Belgian triple, aged in Chardonnay barrels, and. I've had this before, but I'm going to have it again now just so I can share it. If you say alt beer, I'm going to hang up on you. No, it's a triple. It's a triple. It might be an alt or uh, English bitter. Yeah, you know, with Jamil, thing. you never know. Yeah. Sorry? I said with Jamil, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this one's kind of unique. So it has that Chardonnay character right up front, but you still get the triple. And I wanted to share this beer because... If you're deciding where to enter it, there's a couple of places you could put it. Probably the, what hits my mind um, is the 33B, especially wood, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, right off the bat, that's where I'd, I'd probably put it. But you could also say, and I don't know if you've seen the 2021 BJCP, and they've added this grape ale category. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't really read the guidelines, you might think it's not a tie in grape ale, it's grape ale. You might think, hey, this tastes like Chardonnay. Let's put it in there. And it does. Um, however, it's a triple base. And if you read the guidelines, there's a specific, and I, I highlighted this before we started. It says, oh crap, let me back up. <laughs> that it can't amazing. have any bubble gum or uh, where is it? Banana bubble gum and the like are considered false. So the base beer for this hmm. style has to be very clean. So if you didn't read those guidelines and understand, hey, you as master judges are going to read that. And you're going to say, there is a clove, bubble gum, and banana in this, and that's not the style. Yeah. And you're going to ding it. So the point I was going to try to make with this was it's fantastic beer. Actually, it's a wonderful beer. Make sure you read the guidelines <laughs> when you enter <laughs> right. and know where you should put it in, in a competition. And join a homebrew club, and they'll help you. Yes. you know, I've seen, I've had many people help me, and I've, had, I've helped many people decide where to put their their beers and they've won medals and i've won medals because of it yeah and also a different set of taste buds always helps send those beers to us we've done that for plenty of people as well and we could do any and all we need some beers beers. yeah Yeah. you should right Right. that'd be great anybody who needs help uh you know entering where do i enter this beer or whatever we've we've done that for several people so here's another thing just real quick and then i'll let you guys go uh you were talking about uh, you know, knowing uh, the region, maybe knowing the judges, maybe that's a little bit, uh, you know, uh, weird. What would, would a would a region score this worry better? Would there be a better region or a better competition to enter this beer than, say, another competition somewhere else in the nation? Um, I know it's a, probably so a there, hard there question. There are some but... competitions that kind of favor the exotic, Okay. Uh, especially mm-hmm. in Texas, uh, I've noticed that the Dixie Cup here in Houston, mm-hmm. if you've got an interesting beer, you're more likely to medal. Definitely Inquisition, which is run by the Austin Zealots. Okay. Uh, the more interesting your beer. Uh, but if you're looking for a classical style, um, you know, some of the bigger comps will, will be very strict to, you know, more on point to style. Blue Bonnet being one of them. Right. So those creative uh, artistic brewers wouldn't want to enter that when they then enter these other competition yeah, just yeah to I, I you enter your alt slash better <laughs> yeah I, I think the bigger competitions that have been around for a, a really really long time it's much more important to be very good at a very specific style mm, okay you can't really get around get around with or get away with cross entering in a big prestigious competition like i'm not going to cross enter something in nhc i'm not going to cross enter something mm. at blue bonnet because it's just not gonna it's not gonna hold up mm. uh, but regional mm. ones smaller competitions 
uh, where the pool that you're competing against is is different, then you, you stand a better chance of it. And that kind of goes to Jamil's argument about just brew the best version of that subcategory, that specific beer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. All right, Andy, cool. Matt, we'll let you go. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for your time. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks Thank for having us, guys. All right, guys. We'll see you guys, guys at uh, HomebrewCon, hopefully. Yeah. I'll be there. We're planning on it. All right. Okay. Uh, all right, everybody, hang on real fast. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to we have a special beer tasting segment uh, lined up. And uh, you, boy, you you won't want to miss this. It's uh, Doctor Homebrew. Uh, don't go anywhere. <laughs> Pausa rapidinho agora para falar de dica de ouro para os papais e mamães. Depois de experimentar a nova Hug Supreme Care Fralda Roupinha, tudo ficou ainda melhor para o meu filho. É a única com canais em X que se adaptam aos movimentos, com duas vezes proteção noturna e cintura elástica que se adapta ao corpinho do bebê, além de ser super fácil de colocar e tirar. Praticidade pura. Então guarda essa dica. Nova Hug Supreme Care Fralda Roupinha. Bebê, estamos juntos nessa, mais do que nunca. Agora curta seu podcast. I'm sorry to tell you this, but we're gonna have to pour you out. Back to Dr. Homebrew. All right, thanks for sticking around, everybody. Um, on today's show, the second segue we have is another non-alcoholic uh, beer <laughs> talk because number one um, I like them and number two this is a new one that I didn't even really know about until last weekend uh, Guinness is one of my favorite breweries that that the uh, stout is just awesome and uh, you know every every beer drinker has had their moment in the sun with Guinness I'm sure but Guinness has a non-alcoholic beer out a non-alcoholic version of their draft can um, it is sub 0.5%, and uh, I think it's great. I was very apprehensive when I first found out about this beer, and I am excited that, <laughs> that I actually really liked it. I, I liked the beer a lot. So we all got some, and I have some regular Guinness to compare it with. And uh, I have a triangle test. So I want to see if I can pick it out, because Guinness is one of these beers where, like, if it's damaged really in any way, it just tastes like a penny. It just doesn't taste good. It's not good. Have you been licking a lot of pennies, JP? I used to, you know, as a kid. Sure. <laughs> to, where I got my, just my chew vitamins. them up, see, see how soft they are, like how much zinc is in them or something. Yeah, yeah. why not? Um, but, you know, it's just that metallic, that just nasty mm-hmm. yeah. flavor. Like, funky Guinness is never good. It's never good. Um, no, dark oh, yeah. malt. I, I love dark beers and a lot of the darker malts, but they can oxidize in really funky ways and age in really funky ways. Sometimes I I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. So I got three, you know, the old triangle test here. First of all, let me turn this candle out. Damn. Okay. Here's the non-alcoholic. If you're not paying attention, you're going to grab this (laughs) and you're going to think it's real. Well, here, that's... Uh, <laughs> there we go. Well, that's, maybe that's why they make the can with the blue bands on it for, for sure. the uh, non-alcoholic one. Yeah, 100%. It's mostly, mostly black, but blue bands on the top and bottom. Yeah, with, with a big, big blue zero. zero. But, like, you know what I mean? If you're just if you're not paying attention, you go, okay, whatever. Because these big brands, you know, they, they throw a little zhuzh into their labels from time to time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but, like, this is... I have no idea what this is. It, they look exactly the same. I mean, maybe these are the same beer. I have no idea. Well, it's a triangle. So, yeah, two of the right. three are going to be the same, right? But all three of these look identical. They smell identical. I mean, these these are the same beers. And you would never know it. And what we got to do, I want to do a segment on how to do non-alcoholic beers. I mean, I think White Labs has an enzyme to help with that. I'd love to try to get Chris White on. I, I definitely get kind of a difference between the alcoholic and non-alcoholic, but it's it's not a bad difference, right? I mean, there's enough varieties of Guinness already. There's the Guinness Draft. There's Guinness Extra Stout. There's the you know, Cooper was talking about this earlier. There's a lot of a lot of Guinnesses out on the shelf that have some subtle differences from one another, and it, I, to me, it's not outside the normal variance between the the different alcoholic Guinness styles. See, this is what I was thinking is um, I had one at my, my father-in-law's house 
And I'm drinking it like out of a glass, and I'm like, it sort of just tastes like damaged, like heat damaged Guinness. You know, mm-hmm. it's just a little bit. It's not. It's not really that that creaminess was sort of there, but not really, and it was sort of not. I don't know. It was it was off a little bit, but you could easily put that chalk that up to this is a damaged beer. So you know, yeah. but if you if you had two Guinness, normal Guinness, and then you grab a non alcoholic, you would never know it. You'd never know it. So I don't I, know. I think to me, I mean, I can. Do you want me to talk a little yeah. bit about what no, I perceive I, as the differences? I definitely I, do. I perceive the normal Guinness as being slightly more roasty and slightly more creamy, but. I don't per- I, I perceive the the non-alcoholic one to not have any flaws, right? This is not something that I I taste I perceive as watery, but it's maybe not quite as creamy and maybe not quite as roasty. Mm-hmm. I'm just smelling them so far. It smells like the the real Guinness to me. It smells like it's going to be a little sweeter beer when you taste it. Although you, I don't know, you can perceive sweetness in your nose. It's, it's sure, man. You Why not? Your tongue, <laughs> yeah. but you get hints of things that tell you this is going to be something sweet. Like, and, and I think ethanol is one of those things, right? Because ethanol, ethanol, yeah, it does give a perceived sweetness. I think even at a lower concentration. I um, I tend to agree with you, Shar. Uh, you know what you're saying about uh, you know not watery, but just not as roasty, not as creamy. I think that hit. But you know, as I'm drinking these three. I thought I knew which one was was the non-alcoholic from my first impressions. But I think as all the flavors sort of blend in together in my palate, I'm changing my mind. And I don't know if that's because of the beer itself or because of just my palate is now like they're so close together that all the flavors in my palate help wash everything together. Like they're this close. It's not like with Heineken. The Heineken double zero, you can tell but you're okay with it. You know, it's like, it's not, it's not beer. It's not a beer. It's not a Heineken, but it's good enough. It's like cubic zirconium, right? Or cubic zirconium. (laughs) It's it's not a real diamond. Cubic zirconium is okay for most purposes, but But you know, it's okay. It does the job. It's shiny and whatever. And like, it's the interesting thing is, I don't know if this is a glass variance, but like this sample, number three, the head sort of died down, but one and two are not, are creamy as hell. And Do you I know thought, which one you have two of or not? Not yet, but I uh, okay. Taryn texted me, so I haven't looked at it. But I thought number one, I thought this one would have been the non-alcoholic. So the one I thought was non was alcoholic has lost its head. So I, I I don't know anymore. I guess is really the point. Yeah, I mean the flavors on this one, like you were saying about the Heineken JP, I the Heineken Double Zero was okay. I thought, but it didn't didn't really impress me. This is one where. There's a difference, and to me, it's perceptible, but yep. it's not enough of a difference where if if I was somewhere and like, you know, I don't want to have a, a beer because I need to drive or I just don't want to have more, but I wanted to just have something that tasted good, I mm-hmm. would drink this Guinness Zero and be probably pretty happy with my choice. Well, we're definitely talking about a, a beer that is a lot more flavorful, just on its own than oh, oh yeah so, yeah that's that and, and to me maybe maybe that's why it why, maybe that's why to me this is more you know palatable is the wrong word but maybe not why it's maybe something that to me would be a good substitute because there's just more flavor to it in general i mean uh, he, like he, like kind it's not a hop it's not an alcohol monster it's a four percent beer so here's the you know. the difference I've, I've picked in my mind what the different one is and that's the number one it's the middle one because it isn't as creamy. There is a lack of creaminess. There's almost a sharpness to it. There's almost it. The Heineken zero or double zero, I guess has a, um, I don't know, a, a, a tin or, or not a metallic necessarily like a, like a weird brightness that this has also. And so I'm, I'm like, I, like if you put Heineken double zero in a glass of Guinness, this is what I would imagine it would taste like. It's like that. That's how reminiscent it is. That's the recall that I have. Of it. So that's why I'm picking it. There is a there's a roast level to it, but it is very subdued. Um, it's more like a brown malt than a, than a, a roasted malt. And I wonder if they had to back that off to make it taste right without the alcohol there. You know, I would imagine I you might, have to might have to. Yeah, but it it doesn't finish. Um, 
creamy. It finishes almost uh, acidic. Not acidic, but um, yeah, I guess acidic. Yeah. I think you need to look and see which is which now. You, you know, know like, I'm wondering normal if these just are sort of from the uh, Baltimore location. They are not. They are from um, they are from uh, Ireland. Hmm. Yeah, the brewed in Dublin. Even the double zero, or even the zero. All right, let's look. Let's see what see which one it is. Uh, did she not do it yet? Oh my god! I'm gonna literally. <laughs> I'm gonna find out before I kill my okay. wife. Uh, following uh, up. So, Cooper, should you and I just talk among ourselves here? Yeah, I think that. So, I'm looking at the head on the the Guinness, and my the head is falling flat faster on the real Guinness. The creamy head of the zero zero is just standing up like fluffy, you know, moose. It's just insane. I I totally agree. And just looking for, well, I guess I have my virtual background on now, but this is like, yeah, I definitely have probably a twice as thick of a head on the zero than on the regular traditional Guinness. Mm-hmm. It is um, number one. I was right. All right. So, so the one, one is the Guinness or the zero? Zero. Okay. And there was only one of them. Okay. And there's only one of them. And the yeah. head was falling flat faster on the other one because that's what we observed. Yeah. Too. On on the three. On the real. Yeah. On the real. Yeah. So it's just a glass variant. But yeah, the one is um, it's a little tartar. Just a little. There's a little acidity. There's a little tartness to it. But again, yeah. But, but like I'm sort of that was sort of the point of my build up is if you fuck with Guinness enough, it can have that flavor, just even in the normal ones. So you wouldn't really yeah. know. You sort of chalk it up to like, oh, okay, whatever. I don't know. I thought it was really interesting, and uh, I'm yeah. very happy to to have these side by side. This is a really, really good NA. I will not name the brewery, but there's another NA stout out there that tastes like unfermented wort mixed with water, and it's just too much roast. That's like all of them. <laughs> You know All what I'm talking about, but yeah. it's yeah, it's terrible. This tastes like an actual beer. This is amazing, and I'm sure their quality people spent a long time developing this. The yeah, and, oh yeah. You know Cle- what? Clearly, they did. Here's the here's the key: drink it out of the can. Mm-hmm. Like I drink it out of the can, and I don't get those tart flavors um, or those identifiers that I do in the glass. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it does taste different. When you it tastes it. different. It just shape, and, and I get some roastiness in my mouth. I wonder if the creaminess will be there. Yeah, I mean the the creaminess is lacking a little bit. <clears throat> the the real Guinness out of a can, it's a little more robust. But I don't know. Like I've said now three times, you would not be able mm-hmm. to tell, especially if you've had one. You can drink th- this and and be fine. I think that can is the Guinness Extra, though, right? So that's the six percent. No, no. Okay, you got regular. Yeah, Guinness Draft. Okay, got yeah. it. I wanted to okay, get the I got Guinness regular Extra. Guinness Draft okay, too. Okay, good, good, good. I got the bottled Guinness Draft style. It's with the widget in the bottle, but mm. yeah, there's so many. Like you said, there's so many different versions. You have to be careful what you're picking if you're kind of yeah, doing for sure. Apples to apples comparison. So. All right, well, that was our Guinness, uh, our Guinness head to head, so to speak. I just I wanted to talk about. It. I thought it was a good idea. Um, it's a great beer, and uh, if you're into the non-alcoholic scene, like uh, like we apparently are, I don't, know, I can't speak for Char, but I know Cooper and I uh, definitely like it. And I, that's, I don't know, I, I, I like it, I like it too. I think it's, I think it's good. There you go. We're the NA crew now, boys. That's, <laughs> that's what we NA are. crew, yeah. <laughs> and it's also fun to do fifty fifty blends. I, I just blended them fifty fifty here. <laughs> you know, I, it, I, it wouldn't be a doctor homebrew if you didn't blend some beer. That's right? True, yeah. I do yeah. really enjoy blending. Um, non-alcoholic beer with my regular beer whenever i just i want to drink something carbonated something with a little bit of zhuzh into it mm-hmm. but i don't want to drink a i don't know six percent beer or whatever i'll just blend yeah. whatever um athletic beer i have with whatever normal beer i have and yeah i great. think a brewery you- would be wise to like if you got a brewery that was as good at doing their nas as this mm-hmm. or as as good at brewing low alcohol beers as this uh, they would they would do well to just you know cater to people that want to keep their edge and just um, have beers that are all two three percent maybe one percent you know not you're, you're never going to get drunk drinking them even if you you know well 
if you really pounded them. But yeah, they probably yeah. Have- I mean, I know the hard part is you know it's the same reason people don't buy you know ESBs or you know bitters yeah. or whatever it's because they're three point two and people go oh what's the point or whatever. Even people yeah. I tell like I told Warren that it's like dude you got to check these beers like what's the point? <laughs> I don't know mm-hmm. asshole. Mm-hmm. Just cause it's the point of you. <laughs> anyway, um, Do you remember when Tasty would talk on the session about like when he would go out golfing, he'd make his uh, like IPA and then he'd also get like a he'd, he'd also carbonate just regular water and he'd like mix them one to one. So essentially he'd go out with like a three percent beer, mm. uh, like a little keg he'd take with him, like to go out golfing with friends. And that I thought that was an amazing idea. Right. You just take pure water, carbonate it. And then just dilute down something that's really flavorful and good. Well, I mean, Jamil does that with his shallow grave. He's, you know, he makes a watery watery grave. grave. Right. You take a shallow grave, robust porter, and you cut it Mm -hmm. with carbonated water. And it makes a great mild. And that's, and you can do stuff like that. Anyway, so uh, blending beers is not that bad. I know it pisses a lot of people off, but uh, who cares? Anyway, let's take a (laughs) quick break, everybody. We'll come right back. We're going to wrap things up here on Dr. Homebrew. Hang on. Now, back to the examination. All right, thanks for sticking around, everybody. We're about to get out of here. I want to thank the boys from uh, Competitive Homebrewing, the Facebook yeah. on uh, the, the group on Facebook. Appreciate them some stopping cool, by. Cool stories there, you know, just the cross entering, some of the behind the scenes stuff. It's fun to talk about that with people yeah. that are really obsessed about winning medals and, and doing well in competitions. Yeah, I, I it think- sounded crazy. We can pick their brains for hours and maybe mm. learn how to do better in competitions ourselves here. But you know, they got something going on. The statistics part of it was interesting to me. You know, just like they do all these data spreads and like, you know, get all analytical about it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I would just the, want to like yeah. give them my sheet. I, mean, here, I don't know. You tell me. I don't I'm, I don't want to. I could <laughs> never. I'm not the type of person to go back and look yeah. at how many entries there were and put it in my sheet and like make sense of the data. That's not me. Yeah. Well, well you just message them and they'll tell you where, where to enter your beer in the country. And, and <laughs> should be just a service, you know? Yeah. What five category? bucks. Yeah. yeah. Give me a, you know, a fraction of Bitcoin and I'll tell you, uh, what do you got? And now I know if some guy's out of my backyard looking in my sliding glass door, I'll just ask him, <laughs> Hey, are you from competitive homebrewing? Just seeing what I like to drink. And if he says, yes, I know that's cool. There's not, not a problem. Yeah. They're just like, spying okay. on you. Yeah. Yeah. Just please watch my azaleas. They're freshly <laughs> so whatever. Um, anyway, if you guys are looking to get your beer on this show, yes, we actually do drink homebrew on this show. Email Brian at the brewing and uh, we are ready. We're ready and willing to take your entries in anything you make at home. A kombucha, sp- spaghetti sauce. I don't care. I mean, we don't ferment salami. spaghetti sauce, but yeah. salami, why not? Um, Cured look, meats, yeah. Soy sauce. You ferment soy sauce. Uh, kimchi, why not? I don't care. We'll do whatever you Fetch want. Bite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But uh, more importantly, beer, you know, uh, ciders, mead, wine, anything like that, we'll check it out. Sake. Sure. Why not? You brew sake. Fuck it. Who cares? All right, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And uh, until next time, we'll see you later.